The inspiration for this program came from a white van with the words "Stop me for a quotation" written on the side. Perhaps you've noticed the same thing. But have you ever been tempted to stop the van and ask the driver for a quote? We did exactly that in Romford. My name's Jimmy Dean. I work for Traditional Windows. I've got to tell you now, for twenty years we've been driving around with that, and nobody has asked us for a quotation. Never, never, ever, ever. Do you want a quotation? A horse, a horse. My kingdom for a horse. This program is about quotations. You know what quoting is, don't you? Ambrose Bierce did. The act of repeating erroneously the words of another, usually dead. Quote, misquote, you might say, because that isn't actually what Bierce wrote. Not quite. He forgot to add the last two words. But paradoxically, if I had quoted him accurately, then I would have been doing him a disservice, wouldn't I? But for the next twenty-five minutes or so, what we shall be concerning ourselves with is other people's words and how we use them, and misuse them. But there is no doubting that we do use them. It's a huge industry. For the use of a quote lends the user an illusion of authority and finality. It brooks no swift rebuttal, unless the rebutter is Swift, Jonathan Swift. Try to raise a doubt, and it's not merely questioning the user, but tantamount to heckling Mark Twain or Shakespeare or Marcus Aurelius. Such lèse majesté is simply not acceptable in polite society. And even though we may appear to have little respect for authority, we do seem still to respect the quoter and the quoted. But to begin at the very beginning, as Dylan Thomas wrote, or perhaps it was as Julie Andrews sang, what makes a quote? Who decides? And on what basis? Professor Des McHale of Cork University is one such cultural arbiter. He has compiled more than twenty dictionaries of quotations of one sort or another, possibly best known for his series of humorous quotes: wit, more wit, still more wit, and and so on. How does he know what he's looking for? I don't like a quotation that you have to sort of explain in a footnote, which is half a page long, exactly what the context is and who said it. It really should stand alone, be freestanding, and that's a skill in itself. But then there must be some limit, perhaps, as to its length. I think a quote has to be exceptional to merit more than, let's say, fifty words. I think people get bored if they're listening for that long. And of course, Mark Twain said, "The ultimate thrill in German is waiting for the verb." And I, <laughs> I think you don't want to be waiting for the punchline for too long. I would reckon about fourteen words is ideal. Now, at the other end of the scale, you might ask what a short quotation is. Can you do? Can you achieve some? end in just a very short question. I don't think you can do it in one word, but you can do it in two. And some examples are Miss Piggy's famous pretentious, moi, or、um, Young saying childhood decides, which is a very profound thing to say in just two words, or Sartre's hatred fatigues. So you probably get away with maybe just a noun and a verb, but to put a whole philosophy or a whole sermon, as it were, in, and a whole idea into two words is a very, very difficult thing to do. Brevity is one criterion to be sure. For an apt quote, often aspires to the condition of poetry and its beauty and succinctness. But if we are quoting, then should there be at least some obligation on us to be accurate about it? To quote something absolutely perfectly correctly is, is very callous, and I, I never liked it. I always like to hear just the odd little word going on somewhere because it means that the person has remembered it and hasn't looked it up. And if you see a quote being perfectly quoted, it probably means that the person actually went to a dictionary of quotations and looked the whole thing up. And、uh, Oscar Wilde didn't say, but probably should have said, "No gentleman quotes correctly." And I think I think that that's the way. To Example: Shakespeare, you know, is famous for saying, "All that glisters is not gold," and every But he says all that glitters is not gold, which you know maybe slightly better. I have no hesitation whatsoever,、uh, especially for my books, in changing a quote to make it freestanding, to to put words in that weren't there so that the meaning is clear. But I think you can improve on a quote. Now you may think this to be a somewhat cavalier approach, and elsewhere in the world of quotation there is more rigor, more precision, more accuracy, more pedantry. And as a Cambridge man, I should apologise for my descent into bad language at this point, but I'm afraid mention must be made here of the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. Elizabeth Knowles is the editor of that ongoing project and is very clear about their function. We are tracking the language. It's what Oxford does with monitors language, and we try to reflect the quotations that people are using, because it's the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. It needs 
to take account too of the quotations that people have used in the past. The key thing that a quotation has to do is to have both individuality and universality. It ha there is an individual voice. It reflects a particular response to a particular moment. It's what somebody has said or thought at a special time. But it can also be applied by somebody else. Somebody else hears or reads those words and thinks, that says exactly what I want to say now. And that's why it lasts. But don't run away with the idea that Oxford and Cork are in fundamental disagreement. Des McHale tries to spot something he thinks might or should be quotable. Elizabeth Knowles simply makes her decisions one step further along the chain and records when something is already being quoted. And surely both share a degree of omnipotence in being able to confer a kind of immortality upon those they grace with their gift of inclusion. You always try to do that on the basis of usage. You're not sitting here in a sort of godlike way saying, I am going to appoint you and I'm going to appoint you. You're looking at the language and you're looking at what is being said and what is being quoted. I think one of the interesting things about quotations is that you can't in the end predict what is going to last. Who would have thought, for instance, that the following four words would earn their place in the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations? He would, wouldn't he? That remark, of course, made by Mandy Rice Davis during the Profumo scandal when told in court that Lord Astor denied having had an affair with her. I don't think anybody would have said that is clearly going to be a quotation that everybody knows today. But it is. And it's a quotation that everybody knows because, again, it's very useful. Yes, it is particular to a moment, to a special person, but it's so useful. People say it. They use it as a response. Yes, if Mandy Rice Davies had a pound for every time that has been used, she'd probably be able to buy out the entire Astor family. But then why shouldn't she be paid if others profit from her work? Novelists are paid if their words are used by others. Songwriters certainly are. Who owns a quote? Des McHale. I think quotes belong to everybody. Presumably, for legal reasons, it's the person who originally says the quote, maybe the person who first writes the quote, but there's so many different media. Suppose you took up an idea that's in a quote. I think it's a legal minefield, and I don't think it's ever been tested in the courts. I hope it won't be tested in the courts, because I think it would hardly be worth anybody's trouble, but who would really go to that much trouble? Presumably some would. So if you are trying to compile a book, then whereof one cannot quote, thereof one must be silent. It seems you're not allowed to quote Wittgenstein, because I've read books on Wittgenstein, and people say, we'd love to have quoted Wittgenstein here, but we're not allowed to. Now, that, that's his, his executors, of course, and his heirs and whatever, but uh, I don't know if, if, if that's a good thing. I think if you say something, put it in the public domain, and you're just talking about a short extract. Now, if, if I write a book of a thousand quotes, and somebody comes along and quotes 999 of them, I think I'd be annoyed, because they're infringing copyright. But a single quote, which is maybe only 10, 15 words being quoted, really, I don't think infringes copyright. It, especially if I manipulate it to make it sound exactly like I wanted to sound. But most people are very, very generous in life to it. And Woody Allen's a little touchy, I think, as well. But again, because I regard Woody Allen as one of the great... With Oscar Wilde, I regard him as probably the greatest and most quoted person. Anybody who said, um, my troubles all started when I went to a school for mentally retarded teachers, I think <laughs> is, is really very funny. Or, not alone is there no God, but try getting a plumber at weekends. You know, I mean, these are marvellous, these are wonderful quotes. I think, though, people do like to, if they make a quote, they do like to see their name beside it, you know, it's, it's only natural like an artist likes to put his or her uh, name on a painting, they, they do like it to belong to them in that sense and I think they should. Now I, I'd very much like if somebody's doing a public speech saying uh, as Mark Twain once said, you know and then they actually give the quotation, I think that is good, they're showing it's not their own. Of course a lot of people pass off quotes as their own and I mean why shouldn't they, if they bought the book well then it sort of belongs to them in a sense but I think you'd probably know if I said something like that, that it, I wouldn't be good Enough. Does Elizabeth Knowles see that issue in a similar light? A Dictionary of Quotations is not an anthology of passages where you have gone through and selected representative pieces of somebody's writing. It is a collection of quotations of things which people have quoted which are on the move in the language. And therefore, of course, in one sense, whoever originally wrote or said the words is the author, with all that that implies. 
but certain words, phrases, expressions, sentences become so widely known, become so widely quoted, that they do take on a life of their own within the language. They may then be slightly altered. We get into the whole area of misquotations, which are a lot more interesting than than just errors. They very often tell us quite a lot about how a particular person or an event is perceived. I mean, this is why some of the famously apocryphal quotations uh, last, uh, Marie Antoinette and let them eat cake, fairly generally known, I think, that no, she didn't say it, something similar was attributed to an earlier queen, but it survives because it has become a very useful shorthand way of referring to a particularly frivolous approach to a serious subject and therefore it's used elusively and I think it's much more interesting than than just saying well of course that's a mistake she never said it if you ask yourself but why is it still used and remembered you think well actually it filled a linguistic gap it gave us a way of encapsulating a particular attitude which has been very useful Now the business of misattribution that was mentioned there, that's interesting. Clark Gable might be famous for having said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, but he did not write those immortal words. Many are the actors, public speakers, and even comedians who rely upon others putting words into their mouths and are happy to go on taking credit, often in perpetuity, when the hack who penned the deathless prose languishes forever in obscurity. The person who wrote the line gets very, very little credit indeed. I think, you know, well, they accept that as a fact of life. They take the money and run. But they must feel pretty bad when they see someone like Bob Hope getting a big laugh on the screen and they actually wrote the, wrote the line. Although Bob Hope did integrate this once. He was caught with his pants down, as it were, and he didn't have a, a retort. And he said to the person who taunted him, he said, uh, you wouldn't get away with that if my scriptwriter was there. There may be a much more utilitarian explanation of who gets credited with quotable lines. Whoever has written it the particular person has delivered it. And that is the name the public are going to associate, and that's probably the person they're going to look up. So you need often to take account of what access you're providing people. You know, what names can they go to and find this? But one thing we have not so far addressed... Who uses all those quotations gathered so assiduously by multitudes of collectors? Jerry Seinfeld has a marvellous sketch where he describes people's main fears. Uh, Number two main fear in the world in the service seems to be death. Number one main fear is public speaking. So you would much prefer to be (laughs) actually in the coffin rather than delivering the eulogy, it seems. And I think people need some help. That seems to be a main audience of people who buy these books. So it is not merely those of us in the chattering classes who turn to the master wordsmiths of the past to bolster our public pronouncements, not to mention our fragile egos. It is everyone else as well. Who these days is immune from having to, uh, excuse the expression and the split infinitive, deliver a presentation? Which of us can avoid sooner or later having to make a speech at a wedding, say? And what do many of us do, unaccustomed as we are, if faced with the prospect? We look for help. We sometimes look for it from this kind of person. My name is Lawrence Bernstein, and I'm a professional speechwriter. I'm approached to write speeches. It can range from diplomats coming to speak in the UK, right through to probably the most common, which is people's weddings. It would be an enormous generalisation to say that every client wanted a quotation. However, the number who start off by saying, I would like to make some really funny quotes and throw in some very, very humorous references are in the majority. One area that the whole quote, the use of quotes can go wrong is by overdoing it. When you get into your 16th Elvis quote of a 10 minute speech, then generally people are going to be yawning away in the corner. Yes, we all have to face the fact that one generation has to give way to the next. And whereas references to Chesterton or Hilaire Belloc or even Morecambe and Wise might have set the table on a roar once upon a time, maybe it's time to roll over Beethoven and let today's celebrities take their place. And I use the word in its most despicable sense. Noel Gallagher gets as many mentions now in the requests for a quote in a speech as, say, Mark Twain. In uh, Oasis's Wonderwall, 
there is a line that all the roads that lead us there are winding. One other trend that I have noticed and changing literally in the last decade is, is a sense of inverted snobbery coming into both speeches and the way that people want to be perceived. And I think that perhaps characters who are not as accessible to a wider audience, who may have said the most fantastic things and put them in the most perfect and relevant way, are being avoided for fear of the speaker appearing too highbrow. I think we see this with politicians and without naming names, I think it is very obvious that some of them do anything they can to dumb themselves down and would much rather quote, you know, a contemporary celebrity than they would a Cicero or a Marcus Aurelius. And so we finally get to the politicians. What can I say about politicians that hasn't been said before? I don't even have to try. Here is Simon Hoggart, political sketch writer for The Guardian, to do it for me. Politicians these days don't quote very much. You never hear a Tory say, as Edmund Burke said, or even these days, as Winston Churchill said. Partly it's because they don't want to seem old-fashioned. There's a terror of appearing not in tune with modern times. What they want to do is create the quote, or, as we call it these days, the soundbite, of which, of course, Tony Blair produced some classics like Education, 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 and an even greater classic, this is no time for sound bites. I feel the hand of history on my shoulder. It's not a day for the, for the sound bites, really. We can leave those at home, but I feel the I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder. I really do. And presumably feel the hand of a writer over that shoulder, spinning out the words being delivered. For we must face the fact that these days even politicians' words are often written for them by someone else, aren't they? I know, it's a dirty little secret, isn't it? Some politicians don't write every word they say. But nevertheless, our statesmen are just as anxious as ever to be immortalised in the dictionaries of quotations, aren't they? Oh, yes, every politician wants to be remembered for what he said. The trouble is, it's very difficult to get people to create lines for you to say. Most politicians aren't geniuses with words, they're no better than the rest of us. So it can be rather difficult and embarrassing. A classic example, Margaret Thatcher's speeches were, to a large extent, written by Ronnie Miller, the playwright, who knew other playwrights, so he gave her the line from Christopher Fry based on his play, The Ladies Not and she then said, You turn and if you, you want, want to. to. <laughs> she got a huge cheer at the time. She didn't want to say it because she wasn't interested in drama and she didn't know about the Christopher Fry play. So it was a classic example of it being imposed on her. The ladies not for turning. <laughs> It's one of the very few lines from a recent politician that actually has gone down in, in recent history because uh, it can be applied to almost any situation. I'm not for turning. You turn if you want to. I, I feel it would be remiss of me, while we're on the subject of quotable politicians, to let the occasion pass without paying tribute to a giant in the field and in the house and in the restaurant and in the bar, the mighty John Prescott. Bear in mind that something like 70 to 80 percent of the actual demand are single parent households or single youngsters or people who are living in a single house. Can you do that again? I made that crap. A lot of his remarks may have been apocryphal, but they're still very funny. They got attributed to him because he was Prescott. Uh, the Green Belt is a Labour policy and we intend to build on it. Getting after a bumpy aeroplane flight, he allegedly landed and said, it's great to be back on the terracotta. Which opens up a whole new area for us, because so far we've been talking about people keen, desperate even, to be remembered for what they have said. But there are people desperate not to be remembered for what they have said. One group of people stands out in this respect. The score there was Southampton 4, Brighton 2 which is exactly the same as last year's result when they won 3-1. Yes, the sports commentators have earned themselves a significant place in the history of recorded words by getting the words wrong. They indeed have a whole series of dictionaries devoted to their blunders, which even has its own generic title. So I'm Barry Fantoni, and I've edited Coleman Balls really right from the start. The funny thing is that I can remember the first one... Somebody sent a letter in saying, I heard on the radio, somebody say, and there was an athlete's name mentioned, this athlete is now in the kind of league of Wikipedian dispute, who it actually was, and actually said it, but he opened up his legs and showed his class. And Patrick Marnham was editing the letters page, and he said, um, 
this is interesting, put it in and see if we get any response from it. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks, other people had started to spot commentators making a hash of things. They were all by David Coleman. He won't like me saying this, but they, in fact, were by him. And so we called it Coleman Balls. And then it grew. It grew from that period onwards. And for those of you watching in black and white, the pink ball is just behind the green. The earliest forms of Coleman Balls, and my favourite form, is still the ones in which metaphors are, are mixed. Many clubs have a question mark in the shape of an axe head hanging over them. I think the big guns will come to the boil. And the Bulgarians are doing all they can here to waste every last inch of time in this game. Uh, that's another nail in his afternoon. They've tasted the other side of the coin on so many occasions. They are staring down the barrel of a wooden spoon. I bet Keegan will be jumping like a jack in a beanstalk. It was the game that put the Everton ship back on the road. It was a very hot potato at the time. We thought we'd put it to bed, but to have it regurgitated now is pointless. There are thousands of dictionaries, compilations, anthologies, collections and selections of one sort or another offering selected quotable extracts. Why, there's even a regular program devoted to quotes right here on Radio 4. Put the word quotes into that well-known search engine and you will be presented with more than 278 million website options. What the Internet is famous for, pornography, garners a measly 22 million. The public demand appears to be insatiable. So we're dealing with something ubiquitous. If you want quotes on one-legged black lesbian motorcyclists who play mahjong, then the chances are there is a website for you replete with quotes on that subject. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against one-legged black lesbian motorcyclists who play mahjong. After all, some of my best friends play mahjong. But the phenomenon is phenomenal. Is it to be explained in terms of security in a postmodern world where everything is contingent and relative, so constructing links to other living dialogic threads woven by a Bactian socio-ideological consciousness around the given object of an utterance and becoming itself one of the voices anchoring us to a coherent chain? Or is it to be explained by the fact that there's money to be made out of it? Dr. Steve Smithson is Senior Lecturer in Information Systems at the London School of Economics. Oh, there must be money made, definitely. I mean, as far as I'm aware, it would seem to be through advertising. Typically, people who are looking for literary quotations need them in the context of giving a presentation or a lecture, and there's that notion of appearing to be erudite, well-informed, well-read... Um, so, in a sense, the website has the ability to offer advertisers this fairly large audience of, you know, ABC1 type consumers and advertisers who wish to access that audience. There must be money in it, yes. It was Homer who first pointed out that the World Wide Web is now available on your computer. Homer Simpson, that is, of course. But do these websites of endless quotations on the most abstruse subjects deliver the goods when compared to the traditional methods? I was interested, especially in comparing um, websites with printed books, and so I took, purely at random, I'm not even sure if it is a literary quotation, but um, I used Truth is Stranger Than Fiction, and I searched, f I think it was five websites with that quotation. The first four didn't find it at all. And the fifth one, it did actually find four relevant quotations. Two of these were from Mark Twain, and one was from G.K. Chesterton. And interestingly enough, I also took four printed books of quotations and did the same search. Um, three of them didn't find it, and the other one did find it and attributed it to Lord Byron. So is the most important thing about a quote, who originally said it? Whatever is being said has probably been said before, and you can probably find it in the Bhagavad Gita, or by Suetonius, or Aristotle, or Marx, Karl, or Groucho, take your pick. We should not be surprised at this. Elizabeth Knowles of the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations certainly isn't. Similar ideas come up across the centuries, and... 
they're not just plagiarism. Uh, I mean, sometimes, sometimes somebody will deliberately quote. They'll quote because they want the, the resonance and the echo. But I think it's fascinating when you find that somebody in the 20th or 21st century and somebody in the 18th or 19th is saying something very similar, often because they're in circumstances which relate. But you hear, you can always hear people talking to each other across the centuries. Great thoughts can sometimes transcend their thinkers, or not. Des McHale. Maybe I should let you into a trade secret now at this stage. Um, if I make up a quote myself, I make up some quotes myself, not all that many, you may per book maybe one or two, but I never put my own name on, because if you put your name on, it's a bit like saying, I made up this marvellous joke a few minutes ago, no one's going to laugh. You say, I heard this one from a fellow in the pub the other night, and then you have a chance. But if I make up as a, I, I, I have a sort of um, pseudonym that I use, right? So I made up the pseudonym, I won't say what it is, uh, but I put that in the book. I maybe, if I have a few good thoughts, I'll put maybe two or three in per book. But then I find that pseudonym in lots of other quotation books in the next year or two. So I'm flattered in a way. I know they've been reading the book, but I know that uh, my books, and uh, uh, if I'm going to use somebody else's one, I'd probably put them in person. Remember, people like me, jokers, joke book compilers, quotation writers, let's be honest, we are inferior personalities. There is something wrong with us <laughs> I should be saying this. Or we wouldn't do that, wouldn't have this activity. Because, in a sense, we're trying to impress other people by our tremendous knowledge and activity. We're not terribly creative people because we've made up very few of the jokes ourselves, you know. So, I mean, we are actually peculiar people, and therefore we wouldn't be doing this activity if we weren't. So, that's to be taken into account all the time. You are dealing with strange people who feel the compulsion and need to gather up other people's witty remarks or whatever and put them in book form, put their name on it to impress other people. Now, that's a bit pathetic, really, isn't it? <laughs> Forgive us our petty vanities, and forgive us for omitting your favourite quote or any other shortcoming we might have displayed. We've merely tried to explore a few of the byways of the subject for your delight and edification, and if we failed, then take solace in the fact that, as the man said, if something is worth doing, then it's worth doing badly. Thank you for listening. I wish you the goodliest imaginable day, and you can quote me on that.